This morning's Torah portion is called Vaihi. Vaihi means and he lived, and it's speaking of Yaakov living in Egypt, but it has more of a deeper connotation of about him living to 147 years long enough to the point where he could be reunited with Joseph and live to bless all of his children, all 12 tribes of Israel. And so we are going to see a beautiful correlation between Yaakov's blessing and the 12 tribes this morning and how that blessing was prophetic of their future even in the diaspora, in their migration throughout the world. So we've got prophecy hidden with the tour portion and we see hidden glimpses of God's character in the parties the plain meaning of course is the importance of living to bless like Yaakov lived long enough to bless his children and we know that this comes from God's character because God reveals that he loves to bless us every Shabbat we say the ironic blessing over the children which is in numbers 6 verse 24 through 27 and in verse 27 he says in so placing my name upon them I will bless him so he's the father that loves to bless his children and he does does so by placing his name upon us. We're going to see hidden glimpses of the Messiah in this Torah portion in the blessing of Judah. In chapter 49, we're going to go through each of the 12 tribes. And you see verses 8 through 12 specifically and prophetically talking about the Mashiach to come through the line of Judah, through the house of David, Mashiach bin David. And of course, we always, through understanding God's character and seeing it revealed through Yeshua, we find application for ourselves in just like Yaakov's words that he blessed his children were so powerful that they ended up being fulfilled in his children's futures in every place that they went. Each son dwelt the way he said they would dwell, dwelled where they said they would dwell, migrated the way he said they would migrate. So the application for us today is our words are very powerful and we must only use them to be a blessing. God dispersed Israel amongst the nations to be a blessing, but if we don't use our words correctly, we're going to bring a curse upon ourselves, upon our families, upon the communities in which we live, but God intends for the tongue to be only a blessing. This is why the tongue is called a double-edged sword, because if you don't use it for blessing, the other side is it'll be used for death, for the curse. So it's a double-edged sword. It brings life and blessings, or curses and death. We're going to see some interesting anomalies in this week's tour portion. This is the only tour portion that starts off without a gap from the last tour portion. Yeah, that's called a closed tour portion. And we're going to look at the significance of what that means. We're going to see an enlarged het in Genesis 49, 12, and an enlarged memso feet in Genesis 50. And we're going to talk about the symbolism there. And then look at correlations with David reaching his death and the correlation of how the scriptures do not say that Jacob died, nor did it say that David died. It says they slept or they breathed out their breath. There's different ways where other people it says they specifically died. Hebrew has a special word like moat for death. But in this week's Torah portion, we're going to see a different word used for Yaakov. And we're going to focus on what that means for us. How is Jacob still living through his descendants, even to our day today? So we have a lot to cover, but it's going to be an exciting and beautiful Torah Parsha with all the depth that God has hidden in this 12th Parsha of the year. This is also the Parsha which closes out the book of Genesis. So next week we go into Shemot, which is Exodus, which means the names. That's the original name for Exodus. And whenever we close out a book of <clears throat> Torah, we have a special blessing at the end that we will encourage one another with after, upon completing a full book of the Torah. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 47, 28. I'll give you a little overview of some of these chapters. 
we're just going and starting this Torah portion at the end of chapter 47, but it goes right into chapter 48 where Yosef takes his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to be blessed by his father, Yo Yaakov. So the very first blessing that we see is the blessing of the firstborn. That's why it's being done first, and it goes to Ephraim and Manasseh. Chapter 49 focuses on the rest of the 12 sons, Jacob's blessings for the other 12 sons. And then chapter 50 is going to focus on Yaakov's death at 147 and his burial procession that goes back to the land of Israel with all of Egypt. It's literally the largest burial procession ever in history. And then Yosef lives another 53 years from that time and dies at 110 uh, after his father's death. And he is the first of the 12 tribes to die. His brothers actually bury him. So that's a little overview. And as I mentioned, this Torah portion is the only Torah portion that has a closed parsha, which means there's no gap. Here's a picture from an ancient Shephardic scroll. And... Let's see if my pointer will work. You can see this word here, the Mem, the Aleph, and the Dalit. This is the, la at the end of last week's Torah portion. Here's the Vav, the Yod, the Chet, and the Yod. Vaychi, Yachov, begins our Torah portion today. Not even a gap. Usually they'll drop the new Torah portion down on the next line. And that is because as we are seeing Yaakov living up to 147 he's purposely living long enough where he can bless not only joseph but his two joseph's two sons and all of his sons and he desires in his final words he desires them to be such a blessing that not only are they going to be prophetic but he wants to disclose to them more about the end time prophecies of mashiach he wants to share, like, sometimes we know everything and we get excited about telling everybody everything that we know and God holds us back from that because people aren't ready for that. Well, this closed parsha has two symbols. One is that Yaakov's mouth was closed from fully giving all that he knew, all that had been downloaded from Melchizedek in his 14 years studying from Shem, with Shem, and also all that God had revealed to him in vision about the coming Messiah down through his son's descendants and how they would play a part. He was so excited to tell them all that he knew, but his lips were closed because his son's heart was closed. They weren't ready to hear. Sometimes we're not ready for the full truth, right? God is very careful to give us how much we can handle. So he closed Yaakov's mouth from giving even more than what we're going to see in chapter 48 and 49 with the prophecies that Yaakov gives about the future. He's limited. God's closing all that he wants to disclose in essence. And so that's hinted at by closing the Torah portion and bringing them together. Something you only see in the scrolls. Verse 28 says, Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. It's interesting this word lived because normally when you're in a foreign country or you're in exile, the Hebrew will say, and he sojourned in the land, right? Why does it say that Yaakov lived when it's speaking of Egypt? It's because when he was reunited with Joseph, it was like the first 17 years of being with Joseph. It was, these last 17 years were so fulfilling, he really felt like he was living the best 17 years of his life. The last 17 years, seeing Joseph again, seeing Joseph's wife was actually Dina's daughter, seeing their two sons, the whole house of Israel come together, is unified. He is so blessed. And so it's like he really lived, this is one of the unique cases where a man can really live even in the exile. And there's a lesson in that little phrase even for us that even while we're still in the diaspora and we haven't yet been gathered back to Eretz Yisrael we can live with the fullness of joy in Messiah even in the land of our exile Joseph remember was a type of Messiah and so while we're always looking forward to returning to Eretz Israel just like Yaakov did and he made Joseph promise do not leave my bones here in this land but take them back with you to bury them in the cave of Machpelah with my father and my father's father Yitzhak and Abraham he didn't want to be left in Egypt but while there God he knew God had a purpose and he could live with abundant joy it says 
Thus Yaakov lived to be 147 years old. And the time came when Israel was approaching death. Interesting. As if to say he did not live the full time of his fathers. He was 147. Remember how old Isaac was? Yitzhak was 180. Remember how old Abraham was? Abraham was 175. So the time came when Israel was approaching death, but he didn't live to the full uh, age span of his fathers. So he called for his son Yosef, and he said to him, If you truly love me, put your hand under my thigh. Remember, we've discussed with Eliezer and Abraham what that meant when a man would put, make, take an oath. He would place his hand underneath the thigh, underneath the place where the seed is in the man's body, basically making an oath with not only him, but all his future generations. And so he has Yosef take this oath and put his hand under his thigh. And he says, out of consideration for me, make sure that you do not bury me in Egypt. Rather, when I sleep with my fathers, you are to carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. He replied, I will do as you have said. He said, swear it to me. And so Joseph swore it to him. Then Israel bowed down at the head of his bed. And you're going to see later when he... Uh, finally expires. When he's blessing the sons, he, when he bows down, he had this special staff that he would bow over as he would uh, bless these, these sons. And this staff is said to be the staff that was passed down from Adam all the way down the priestly line. It was a sapphire staff that Jacob held. And it was the only thing that he carried into the land of um, Laban's home. Remember the land of the north when Eliphaz took all the other riches from him. This was the staff that he hid that little anointing oil in. Chapter 48 says, A while later, someone told Yosef that his father was ill. He took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and Yaakov was told, Here comes your son Yosef. Israel gathered his strength and sat up in bed. Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, saying to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make of you a multitude of people. So this blessing God gives to Jacob, but he's going to pass this blessing on to one of his sons. There's going to be a multitude of people that come from the 12 tribes, but one in particular becomes a multitude of nations, where every other one becomes a nation. He says, God told me that he would give this land to my descendants to possess forever. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. This is basically an adoption process. What Jacob is preparing to do is literally adopt Joseph's two sons in the place of Reuben and Simeon, the first two that were going to get the first two blessings. So there's a process, just like with the oath, that you have to do. And one of those things that you do is you'd bring the children between your knees. So it's like you gave birth to them. Much like the maid, um, the midwives or the maid servants of the women when they would bear children for them, like Billa and Zilpah, they would sit on their knees so that symbolically the children came from between their knees. This is what Yaakov is doing, bringing Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh will be as much mine as Reuben and Simeon are. The children born to you after them will be yours, Yosef, but for purposes of inheritance, these children basically first have to be adopted by me. They are to be counted with their older brothers. Now as for me, when I came from Padan, this is the plain up in the north where Laban lived, known as Padan Aram, Rachel died suddenly as we were traveling through the land of Canaan while we were still some distance from Ephrat. So I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, known as Bet Lacham. Bet Lacham means house of bread. This is where the living bread was born, Yeshua, the bread of life. And this prophecy in Micah 5.1 speaks of Ephratat. It says, even though you were the least amongst the tribes, one great will come from you. And so this is an early reference to that same area. Then Israel noticed Joseph's sons and asked, Who are these? Joseph answered his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. Yaakov replied, I want you to bring them here to me so that I can bless them. 
Now Israel's eyes were dim with age. Reminds us of Yitzhak, his father. So that he could not see. Yosef brought his sons near to him, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. Israel said to Yosef, I never expected to see even you again, but God has allowed me to see not only you, but your children too. So Yosef brought them from between his legs, and he prostrated himself down on the ground. Then Yosef took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, because Manasseh was the firstborn, and the right hand always gave the greater blessing. So he's leading them up to his father who can't see very well. Manasseh to Israel's right, and Ephraim to Israel's left. But Israel put out his hand and laid it on the head of the younger one. And he put his left hand on the head of Manasseh and his right hand on the head of Ephraim. And he intentionally crossed his hands, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Yosef, the God in whose presence my fathers Avraham and Yitzhak lived, the God who has been my own shepherd. And this is another hidden glimpse of Mashiach, the good shepherd. All my life to this day, the angel who rescued me from all harm blessed these boys. So he's giving a special blessing from God as an aspect of the good shepherd and the angel of the Lord who is our protector and rescuer from harm. May they remember who I am. And this is something for us as Yaakov's children, because Yaakov live on, lives on through us. Let's remember what he stood for. This is how he continues to live on. The Torah and the truth that he exemplified is what we need to carry on as his descendants. May they remember who I am and what I stand for. You know, it's interesting because Ephraim's name means Forget, forgotten. Remember, Joseph had forgotten the pain of his past when he had Ephraim. So here, Ephraim's name and Ephraim's descendants even forget their Jewish roots. And Joseph is telling Ephraim and Manasseh, don't forget who I am. Don't forget what I stand for. And we're going to see where Ephraim and Manasseh's descendants, uh, how they migrated and where they have come to and how they relate to us today and how they have forgotten. And likewise, my fathers Abraham and Yitzhak, who they were and what they stood for. Remember what Abraham stood for? What? Righteous. Kindness. Chesed, loving kindness. And Yitzhak was righteousness. Yeah, and Yaakov was truth. So let's not forget what Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, our forefathers, who they were and what they stood for. And may these boys grow into teeming multitudes on the earth. Now this is the beginning of the blessing of multiplication for Ephraim and Manasseh. When Yosef saw that his father was laying his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he lifted up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and place it instead on Manasseh's head. Yosef said to his father, Don't do it like that way, my father, for this one is the firstborn. But remember, Yaakov had supernatural intuition. He knew which one was going to be given the firstborn blessing. This is called the principle of the Yahid son. It's often not even the firstborn. It's the chosen one and the one who would receive a double portion of blessing. So... Yosef doesn't understand this, and he's displeased with his father. And he says, put your right hand on Manasseh's head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know it. He too will become a people, and he too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. And his descendants, Ephraim's, will grow into a melogoyim. This means a multitude of nations where every other tribe has become a singular nation. Judah became the Jews, and you see other nations as they migrate. Dan, you know, naming his uh, migration route. But something about Ephraim, how he is going to be amongst all of the tribes and intermarrying with all the tribes, he's going to become a multitude of nations throughout history. And we see Paul referring to this statement that Yaakov made over Ephraim in Romans 11, chapter 25, I believe, when he refers to the future descendants of Israel, 
Romans 11, verse 25, he says, For brothers, I want you to understand this truth, which God formerly concealed, but now has revealed. Because remember, Yeshua says, I come for the lost house of Israel. And Ephraim led the lost house of Israel to the north and to the west, which we are going to see. He says, so that you won't imagine that you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to agree that has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters its fullness. That's what it says in the English. But in the Hebrew, it's until the Melo Goyim. Basically, until Ephraim has completely reached all the nations and all the tribes. And Ephraim is reaching the nations and the tribes with what? With the knowledge of Yeshua, the Messiah. So he says, until the Melagoyim, and that it is in this way that all Israel will be saved it's through the knowledge of Yeshua, Mashiach ben Yosef, who will, by faith, we believe, return as Mashiach ben David, that Israel will be saved. For as the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov, what no one else could do with these 12 boys and their descendants, Messiah Yeshua has done. He will turn away on all ungodliness from Yaakov, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul is very familiar with this blessing that Jacob is giving Ephraim, and he's basically saying that Mashiach will not come until this prophecy is fulfilled, until it becomes a multitude of nations, and this message of Messiah reaches all of the nations through him. Jacob, in verse 20, then added this blessing. He said, Israel will speak of you in their own blessing in the future by saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And this is the blessing that we place upon our sons. In addition to being like Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, this is why we say, and Ephraim and Manasseh. And you know, it was prophesied that Ephraim would take the firstborn double portion from Reuben in 1 Chronicles 5, verse uh, 1 and 2. It says, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Yosef, the sons of Israel, though not in such a way as for him to be regarded in the genealogy as the firstborn. For Yehuda became greater than his brothers, inasmuch as the ruler came from him. Now, here in Chronicles, which ruler is it speaking of? King David. But it's hinting at the future Messiah who would sit on the throne of David and come through the house of David, Judah. And so in this way, Judah becomes greater in that both King David and Mashiach ben David will come from him. Nevertheless, it says, the birthright went to Yosef, speaking of Ephraim. So here's a little genealogy simplified. Abraham has two sons. Ishmael's the firstborn, but Yitzhak is the Yahid son. He's the one chosen for the priestly line to follow through in the oracles of God. Jacob has two sons. Esau, the firstborn, but Jacob, the younger, is the Yahid son, the chosen one for Messiah to come through. And his name gets changed from the hand that grabs the heel which kind of has a connotation of the tail, somebody who's coming after somebody else, right? God doesn't want Israel to be the tail. He says, I desire that you be the head, not the tail. So he changes his name to Yasharel, Yisrael, the upright one of God. And Jacob has 12 sons and from four different women. And Joseph and Benjamin were the 11th and the 12th sons. And yet, it's through Joseph. Joseph was the Yaqid son. And this is why he chooses Joseph's sons to get the Yaqid blessing of the firstborn of Reuben, as we read in 1 Chronicles 5. So as we trace the migrations route, you can see that Ephraim was prophesied. He says, yes, Manasseh will be a great people too, a great people, a great nation. 
in the future. This is a prophecy. But Ephraim will become a multitude of nations. And before even the United States was in existence, Ephraim was multiplying with the other tribes up in northern Europe. This is what became known as Great Britain, where they settled as they continued to move north and, and west. And we're going to even see their migration route hinted at in prophecy. So we see Britain conquering the world. What do we call it? The British Empire, right? They literally left this little place in Europe and spread throughout the known world and conquered, I mean, not only continents, but islands as well. They've made their mark on everything until about 1947, which is very significant because this is when Israel was given back to Israel, the nation of Israel, and it was at that time that the British, Ephraim, started releasing, just miraculously, not by force or war like has always happened in the past. What did Ephraim start doing? Saying, okay, I'm gonna give India back to India, which had hidden tribes in it. I'm going to give the Isles back. I'm going to give um, even Kenya. They gave Kenya back in 1947-48. 47-48 was such a pivotal time. This is when the British, with no war, just started giving nations back to rule themselves. And Israel was set up for those who recognized themselves in Israel to return to. Then many from Great Britain, if you will, came to the New World, into America, and we see uh, the America being the great nation that he prophesied over, Manasseh, which has been a protector of both Ephraim and the rest of the, the 12 tribes of Israel for the last 250 years. So Judah, of course, he has two sons. And we're going to look at some of the symbolism of Jacob's prophecies over his boys in the heraldry of the, their banners and some of the symbols that help us find their migration routes. So one of the things I like to bring out about Judah is Judah had two sons through Tamar. So both these boys are of the order of Melchizedek. Both of these boys are going to get the blessing of the scepter, not departing from him. We have Zerah. Remember Zerah's hand came out first and they tied a scarlet cord on it. So this scarlet cord, everything about Zerah, whether you see his symbol as a, a hand or as a lion, because the Judah always was represented by a lion, it's always red. It goes back to that scarlet thread. Whereas Perez, which the line of Yeshua and King David came through, it's always going to be a golden line or a golden symbol. <laughs> I can get that to you later. <laughs> So, what's interesting is sometimes Israel was referred to by Israel's father amongst the nations, by Yitzhak. And so, we see Yitzhak's name even being hinted at amongst the nations. Remember in Genesis 48 and 49, Deuteronomy 33, leading the prophetic fulfillments, the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, would dominate the world leading up to the end of the age. But in Genesis 22, 12, God told Abraham, In Yitzhak, your son, your seed, will be called. Which means Israel is his seed, and Israel's 12 sons, sometimes they're going to be referred to or called by the name Yitzhak. And we see this come out through history in the etymology of certain nations and peoples, like the Scythians, comes from Yitzhak, that core root in Yitzhak's name. Saka, Sakasone. And the Saxons, where we talk about a lot of the whites being Anglo-Saxons, that comes from Yitzhak's name. And we even theorized possibly, uh, when we were talking about Yosef being down in um, south of Giza and building those big silos, the place later was named Sakhara. That also has that same root of sons of Yitzhak. <clears throat> who were the primary stock of England and later America, most of these nations named after Isaac. So we're going to correlate a little bit of history here with their migration routes. Deuteronomy 28, 64 says, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even to the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So as God has scattered the house of Israel throughout the nations, think about how they have gotten involved in the idol worship of the Gentiles in which they've lived. And you can think of wood and stone even being significant in two major religions. When 
the Roman Catholics wanted to have a symbol for Jesus' death, Yeshua, what did they do? They really uplifted the cross, didn't they? Everybody had a cross around their neck. Every church had a cross on its steeple. So in essence, you're really paying homage to this cross. It's a symbol. Now God said in the second commandment, don't make any image of anything and don't bow yourself down to it. But they bow down to it. In that way, this prophecy has been fulfilled that even wood has been a focus of their descendants. Stone. How would stone be? Any ideas? Huh? Statues, uh, even obelisks. obelisks, yeah. And of course, Islam, those that assimilated and converted during the Ottoman Empire to Islam, they kiss the stone in Mecca, don't they? And so you see these idols of stone and wood that our descendants have gotten sucked into. <clears throat> Amos 9.9 9 says, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel amongst the nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. And so here's Israel down here, and you can see their original migration routes were to the north and to the west. And then from here, they came to the New World, to America. So we're going to see this hinted at in, um, in one of these verses where it speaks of the north and to the west. Jacob says in verse 20, Israel will speak of you, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Israel then said to Yosef, You see that I am dying, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your ancestors. So this route <clears throat> that they have left and been in exile in the diaspora for the last 2,700 years, they will return. And that returning, that second exodus is beginning now. People are returning to the land. It's been happening since 1948, but ultimately will be completely fulfilled when the age of Mashiach begins, when Messiah comes. He will gather all of his elect back to Jerusalem. He says to Yosef, make sure that you take me back to the land of your ancestors. Moreover, I'm giving you Shechem for your share. This area of Shechem we went to when we were in Israel. This is where Joseph's tomb is buried. And that's the inheritance of Ephraim in the land. More than to your brothers, I captured it from the Emeri with my sword and bow. <clears throat> then Yaakov called for his sons. And he said, gather yourself together. And I will tell you what will happen in the Akharit Hayamim. This means in the last days. He had intention to disclose to him the depth of prophecy that he understood. But remember, his lips were closed a bit. He only gives a little hint at this prophecy. He wanted to give so much more. And he says, Assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov. Pay attention to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my strength, and the firstfruits of my manhood. Though superior in vigor and power, you are as unstable as water. So your superiority will end, because you climbed into your father's bed and defiled it. And then he turns to the rest of the boys and he says, he climbed onto my concubine's couch. <laughs> and so he's confirming, remember when that happened? Now what's interesting, when you look at the 12 tribes and how they would encamp around the tabernacle, do you remember who was to the north and who was to the west? Ephraim was always to the west. And look at how Ephraim has pushed to the west from Great Britain to America. And Reuben was to the south. And you really don't see a lot of Israel in the south. See how it says your superiority will end? If you correlate this with Deuteronomy 33, Moses' blessing, he's basically saying that Reuben, may your seed not totally die out. It's like Reuben's tribe is very little. But once in a while you'll see a remnant of this symbol of water, unstable water in the crest uh, in Europe. So, <clears throat> Ezekiel, there's an interesting prophecy in chapter 11, verse 17 and 20. He says, Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. So the prophecy is, I'm going to scatter you for a time, but there you're going to multiply, and in the last days I'm going to gather you back. And I will give you the land of Israel. 
So in the 1800s, when many Protestant denominations were being formed, they would read prophecies like this and they would say, it can't be literal. There is no nation of Israel. Thus, it must be spiritual. Everything is spiritualized. And so a lot of your Protestant denomination, Christian denominations have spiritual, um, spiritualized Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, and basically usurped it or replaced it with the church. And this is why you'd see blatant prophecies very literal like this. And who could believe that Israel would become a nation again? It says, And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof. So remember, they would be amongst the Gentiles. They would eat like the Gentiles. They would um, worship like the Gentiles, right? They would start following uh, symbols of wood and stone. But what is the promise? That in the last days, he's going to gather us back. And he's going to take away these detestable things. This is good news. And all the abominations, like pork. He says, even touching a dead pig is an abomination to the Lord in the scriptures. So, it's referring to both false forms of worship and, um, and detestable, abominable, um, unkosher foods that we eat eaten amongst the Gentiles. And, he says, I will give them one heart in that day. And I will put a new spirit within them. And I'm going to take away their stony heart. What does a stony heart do? It tells you, makes you say, I don't need that. That's not for me. That's done away with. He's going to take that heart away. So there's good news for even those people that are currently saying, that's not for me, both Jew and Gentile. He's going to put a new spirit in them. He's going to take the stony heart out of their flesh. And he's going to give them a heart like baby skin. So they'll be sensitive to returning to Yah's ways in Torah. That they may, and then he specifies it, just so you know that we're not speculating here. The whole purpose of getting a heart of flesh, this is the whole purpose of circumcision, what circumcision was pointing to. That they would walk in my statutes, that we would desire, be sensitive to his ways, and keep his ordinances, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So this is kind of encapsulating the whole prophecy of Israel dispersed amongst the nations and what is going to happen in the last days through Messiah. Now, when you look at the camp of Israel described in Numbers chapter 1 and 2 at the time of the census, you see that there would be three tribes to the north, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the south, three tribes to the east. Remember, with Ephraim and Manasseh, there's actually 13 tribes. So 13 becomes a very symbolic and powerful number amongst Israel. And wherever they spread, the number 13 became associated with power. This is why the occult has usurped the number 13. It's actually a good number. It's not a bad number. Nothing to be afraid of. And so the 3 times 4 is 12 tribes. But the 13th tribe, Levi, he would encamp around the tabernacle in the middle, right? And each of these tribes had a special stone, and that stone had a special color. So each tribe has a color, a stone, and a symbol from the blessing that we're going to read here in chapter 49. And look at the, the placement of Dan. He's represented by an eagle. Remember in Ezekiel, up in the throne room? They see this unique creature that has four heads. Has the head of an eagle, the head of a man, the head of a bull, and the head of a um, lion. Well, th the heads of these tribes, Dan was represented by an eagle. Ephraim was represented by a bull. Even the prophecy that Ephraim in Deuteronomy 33, he would be like a wild bull pushing, pushing, pushing other nations, other tribal people as he moves west, north and west. Dan and Ephraim are moving to the north and to the west. And the other tribes are following Ephraim. This is why the Lost House of Israel became synonymous with Ephraim because he's kind of leading them like a bull will lead a plow. So you have Ephraim with his brother Manasseh and Benjamin, the younger brother of Joseph. So basically all of Rachel's descendants going to the west. And this, what is the furthest west in England? Great Britain. And what's beyond the waters west? The New World, America. And so we're going to see significant um, migrations of Ephraim and Manasseh with the bull moving to the north and to the west. We're going to see Dan with Naphtali and Asher. And then Judah, remember Judah stays in 
Jerusalem, right? And he's not taken captive by Assyria. He, when he is taken captive, he's taken captive by Babylon many years later, over 140 years later. And he goes east. And much of Judah resided in Babylon, even after Ezra came back and rebuilt the temple. This is why the Babylonian Talmud has greater significance, because the greater sages and the wiser older men had remained in Babylon, and they were the ones that wrote a more comprehensive oral Torah when it was finally written. When Persia captured Babylon, they took Judah along with Issachar and, and, uh, and uh, actually Levi, and uh, part of Benjamin further east to Susa, which is modern-day Iran. This is where Daniel lived out his years. So we see Judah constantly going to the east. Even the way they were encamped hints at their future migration. Rubian and Simeon, they lost the, the blessing. And part of that blessing is to multiply. Remember the blessing that was given to Abraham, I mean to Ephraim was that he'd become a multitude of nations because he got the double portion blessing. That would have normally gone to Reuben, but you notice that Reuben's numbers waned even in the census and then in the migration later. So he's placed to the south, which was the least, mm -hmm. along with Simeon and Gad. And Reuben was either identified as a man or by waters. Now, remember the directional prophecy talking about where God will bring Israel back from at Messiah's coming. He says, surely these nations will come from afar. In Isaiah 49, verse 12, look at what God says prophetically. Surely those who have been scattered will come back from afar. Look, those from the north and from the west. This is how they traveled after the Assyrian captivity up into Europe and to Great Britain and then sailed on to America, to the north and to the west. Where are they coming back from? From the north to the west, to Israel. From the land of Sinem. In the Bible, unless otherwise noted, all directional uh, orientations are from Jerusalem, which ancient maps always made as the center of the earth. So when it talks about north and to the west, it's talking about from Jerusalem. So the tracks must ultimately head north and west, which they do. Now remember in Matthew 15, 24, Yeshua says he was sent only to the lost house of Israel in his first coming. doesn't mean that he doesn't come for Judah. It just means that Judah, he's going to reign with Judah in his second coming. And Judah's going to recognize him in his second coming. But in his first coming, his mission is primarily focused on the lost house of Israel. So as we look at the lost house of Israel in this blessing of Yaakov, I want to bring out some of the symbolism of what Yaakov is saying prophetically and how we can even use those symbols to trace their migration routes today. Numbers 2.2 says, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign. This Hebrew word for ensign is like a flag banner of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall pitch. So every tribe around the tabernacle had a flag with their own symbol that had originated with Yaakov's blessing. There are 12 original tribes in Israel, and after Ephraim and Manasseh replacing Joseph's tribe, it became 13. Look for Judah's two sons, Perez and Zerah, as we discussed. Perez, the golden lion, and Zara, the red hand, or the red lion, because he was the one with the scarlet thread. The tribe of Joseph had their blessing split in half between his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. This act by Jacob of blessing the first and the second born created another tribe, making the final total 13. In Genesis 49.3, which we just read, Reuben, he says, You are my firstborn, my might, at the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. A lot of times a firstborn son would be the stronger one. He would be the taller one. He got the better genes. So this is, in essence, what uh, Yaakov is saying. So he was always symbolized by a very fit and strong man, much like Leonardo uh, da Vinci. Remember, he wrote the man uh, in perfect symmetry and form in his notes. So his first symbol is a man. His second symbol is water. Deuteronomy 33.6 Moses, before his death and before the children of Israel go across the Jordan into the land of Israel, he gives another blessing on each of these tribes. And we don't have time to go cover this this morning because we did, I believe it was in Tor portion, uh, Vezot uh, Habracha, the blessing of Moshe. But 
interesting to correlate these two, the blessing of Yaakov and the blessing of Jacob. And I've just done it here with Reuben. Moses says, let Reuben live and not die, and, lot, and let not his men be few. So because he kind of almost got a curse instead of a blessing, because he defiled his father's bed, his numbers did dwindle, and Moses was basically set, reiterating that, that may he not totally dwindle out, because prophetically, Reuben still needs to have descendants to claim his inheritance in the, the Messianic age, when Messiah takes us back to Israel. Genesis 49.5 goes into Simeon. Simeon and Levi are brothers related by weapons of violence. Another translation says instruments of cruelty in their habitations. Let me not enter their council. Let my honor not be connected with their people. For in their anger they killed men, and at their whim they maimed cattle. Cursed be their anger, for it has been fierce. It almost caused the other nations to wipe out the whole house of Israel in its infancy up in Shechem when they went and um, slew the whole city of Shechem. So Yaakov saying, cursed be their anger. You know, it almost backfired on us. It's been fierce. It has been cruel. I will divide them in Israel and scatter them in Israel. So his first symbol here is a sword. And the other symbol that we see, even here's an old stamp. Like we know Stephen likes to collect the stamps and has blessed us with some of these old stamps from uh, the late 40s and early 50s. They each one have a symbol on the stamp. See the castle? They were the gate builders in Jerusalem, Simeon. And so they would be recognized by a castle on their banner. And... Levi, of course, being the priestly lineage, he would have an ephod as his symbol. But you're going to see a castle on many crests and many banners throughout uh, Europe. And you can rec associate that with Simeon. The connection in my mind with uh, Levi to the swords is after the Golden Calf, they took up the sword against those who were worshipping him. That's another good correlation. Did you guys hear that? At the time, why did Levi, in addition to having a vision that he would be given the priesthood, when all other tribes bowed the knee to the golden calf, Levi was the one that did not. And then they were so zealous for God that, remember, they slew 3,000 in that day? And so here's again, they're using the sword. So Enoch was bringing out that the sword's uh, representation of Levi, not only in Shechem, but also in the Sinai wilderness there. Here is the old stamp for Israel from Israel showing the ephod here's a banner with the ephod on it the blessing for Levi was that Jacob would scatter them or that their future descendants would be scattered amongst Israel and we know that some of the Levites got caught in the um, Assyrian um, siege and went to the north, but then some went to the east through the Babylonian captivity because Levi had no inheritance of their own. They were residing around the tabernacle in the land of Judah where the tabernacle was. So they did get scattered. Now it goes into Yehuda in verse 8. And there's four verses that are given to Yehuda. You know, when you write Yehuda's name, you have a Yod, and you have a hey. And you have a vav, which gives the oo sound, right? Then you have a dalit. And then a hey. Yehuda. This is very similar to the name yod hey vav hey, which has a connotation of behold the hand, behold the nail, hinting at future Messiah. Messiah bin Yosef, who would be hung on a cross. But look at how he would come through the line of Yehuda. The only difference between the Yod, He, and the Vav, He, is this Dalit. And the Dalit in Hebrew is a door. So it's basically saying the doorway for Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, to manifest His word in human flesh through the line of Judah, future king of Israel, would be through Yehuda. He has the same name as Hashem, except with the doorway. So this is even hinted at in his name. And he says, Yehuda, 
this door which Messiah would come through, your brothers will acknowledge you. And this is why they will acknowledge you. Everyone in the house of Israel has heard the message of Messiah and embraced it, except for Yehuda, interestingly enough, through whom Messiah Yeshua came. Remember, this is why Yeshua says, I come for the lost house of Israel and his apostles. Uh, Talmidium in the Hebrew went up into the north and to the west. They knew where the lost house of Israel was. They went to Turkey and then to Rome and then to Spain and then sailed from Spain up into uh, the Ludgate, which is now London uh, of Great Britain, and then went to the Isles. And there's uh, two tribes that resided in the Isles in Ireland and Scotland. And so you see that they knew in that first century, 2,000 years ago, where the lost house of Israel was. It says, Yehuda, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Yehuda is a lion cub. So this is the first symbol that we're going to recognize in the crest when we start looking at these banners. And remember, both his sons are lion cubs. So you have Zerah, a red lion, that's called the rampant lion, and the golden lion is Perez, through which Messiah Yeshua came from. That's the golden rampant lion. My son, you stand over the prey. It even shows, you know, that's why it, the lion is standing. Isn't that interesting? It's not just a laying down lion. Even in this prophecy, this symbol that came through Northwest Europe was from Jacob's original words. You, he crouches down and stretches like a lion, like a lioness who dares provoke him. The scepter will not depart from Yehuda, nor the legislation or the lawgiver, the, the lawgiving staff from between his legs, until he comes to whom Shiloh belongs. Shiloh is an ancient word that the rabbis interpreted as referring to the coming Mashiach. He says, it is he whom the people will obey. So let's look at some of these symbols here. And then we'll go further. This is only half of the blessing to Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. A lion is the symbol of Judah and his true sons. Perez, the golden lion. And Zara, the red lion. Because he had the scarlet red thread around his hand when he came out. Also, two other symbols that you will see for Judah is the grapevine. And um, Zara will also, when they don't have a line, sometimes within the crest you'll see a red hand. And I'll show you some examples of these. This is a family crest. I'll tell you later where it's from, interestingly enough. But let's break it down. You have the golden rampant lines of Judah, right? Here, they're on each side, which means they're dominant. So they recognize their lineage through Perez. But then they're upholding this crest here. And this crest has four uh, sections. You see the red hand of Zara? So Judah, who was ca taken in captivity in Babylon, he knew where his brother Zara was and where he had multiplied up in the northwest. And he later came and settled very peaceably and intermarried within his brother's uh, area, which was Ireland. And so you have both the red brother, Zara, and Perez signified here. Here's Perez also, the golden line, and here's his brother. Now, one sailed there. Remember, Zara left before the Exodus. He left Egypt, sailed across the Mediterranean. And his descendants, the scepter didn't depart from it either. They became the kings of Troy in Greece. And they migrated up and became the kings and queens uh, throughout early um, Europe in these tribal communities before they settled in, um, in Ireland, in the Isles. So this is how Zara got there. Remember uh, Simeon, the castle? Here, also Simeon ended up coming, part of the lost house of Israel, and there was intermarriage between them. And then this castle is set upon the waters, which represents Reuben. 
So you can actually see how this particular family recognized through intermarriage, okay, once we were all Judah, we were all from Perez, right? That was our tribe. And in Israel, we only married within our tribe. But in the exile, we kept together within our different tribal communities and intermarried within different tribal communities. And now, this is actually my dad's mom's family crest, the McNeil family, which came from Northern Ireland. They were recognizing that they're from both houses of Judah, but also Simeon and Reuben. And she actually had a great grandfather named Ruby. They used to call him Ruby for short. They didn't know whether it used to be Rubenstein or uh, Reuben. But here uh, is the proof in this little portion of the crest and how they got there originally. And then, of course, Golden Judah, Perez, would have came later. So just one example of how the crest would incorporate all of these different tribal um, symbols from Yaakov's blessing. Here's another one. You have the red rampant line, so you know that's Zara from Judah, but it's got a golden crown, so there's intermarriage with um, Perez, and it's got the Star of David's. This is a later um, crest that they used to wear on clothing, and this is from some of our Ashkenazi family that came from Germany. So interesting how they recognized their tribal lineage. And you can see a little family tree of Judah that here is the royal house of Zara with the scarlet thread, okay? This is the red line and uh, the scarlet cord. He becomes the Cretan kings as he sails across the Mediterranean after, or even before the rest of Israel went through the Exodus. And uh, he became known as the Miletian kings, the Trojan kings. See, the scepter didn't depart from him either. Then from the Trojan kings came the Scandinavian kings and the Frankish kings. And then the Scandinavian kings comes the house of Wekta and the house of Skuld and then the kings of Denmark and the kings of Greece. And then that comes down to Lieutenant Philip Mount Hatton down here. So this is Zara, if you just did a direct lineage through the ages. But look at how his lineage comes over here through the Miletian kings. They were the ones that very early on settled Ireland. So basically what it's saying is that even though this group, you know, continued to live and dwell in different areas, like Denmark, named after Dan, they were with the tribe of Dan. Dan later came and dwelt with them in Ireland as well. But they came over and intermarried with the golden house, the royal house of Perez, Judah. So this is why many crests have both the red and the gold, because you can actually see that history uh, genealogy has proven that um, Zara and Perez got back together, and that was in Ireland that they got back together. So King David has a son named Solomon, right, through whom Mashiach is prophesied to come. And Zedekiah, remember Zedekiah's daughter, was taken by the prophet Jeremiah up to Ireland. He knew that Judah had resided there. And Perez and Zara are reunited and become the kings of Ireland, and then the kings of Scotland, and then the royal house of Windsor. The royal scepter would not depart from Judah. Through Nathan, uh, we see the genealogy in Matthew being intermarried with Levi, the priestly lineage, and through uh, Tamar, who was from the order of Melchizedek, Yeshua ends up coming from both Judah, L Levi, and Melchizedek. And you can kind of see this. So this is a, just a quick summation of how all of these tribal people of Judah even would follow one another through the diaspora. Uh, let's go on to the rest of Judah's blessing. It says, tying his donkey to the vine. Interesting that Messiah would come through his lineage and he would be hailed as Messiah in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. His donkey's colt to the choice grapevine. This is the other symbol of Judah. Now there's a hidden prophecy in here that goes from him and his first coming to his second coming. Now it says, he washes his clothes in wine. Remember Revelation 19, verse 12 through 14, which refers to Messiah coming with his vesture dipped in blood? Let's look at that. Verse 11 says, 
Next, I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a white horse. Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True, and it is in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. Remember Zechariah 14 says he comes back to save Jerusalem and the Jews arrayed in battle after it has been trodden underfoot for three and a half years. Verse 12 of Revelation 19 says his eyes are like a fiery flame. We're going to see this actually hinted at in Judah's blessing. His eyes are like a fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns, and he had a name which no one knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood, and the name by which he call, was called is the Word of God. Now look at this prophecy. Remember, his eyes are like fire, and his vestiture is dipped in blood. He says he washes his clothes in wine, because his vestiture is red. His robes in the blood of grapes. Well, Revelation likens the uh, coming of Messiah to treading the winepress of God. His eyes are like darkly flashing or brilliant with wine. The Hebrew word here uh, has a connotation of. And here in this word, they're red and flashing. is just like what John was describing, like fiery flame. And there's an enlarged het here in this word, uh, darkly flashing, brilliant with wine, and his teeth white with milk. And this is a picture from a Hungarian scroll. And they decorated, the scribes did, this het with extra crowns and with these little tassels, as if it's a person. Now remember the chet is the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means life. And who came to be life and to give us life more abundantly? He came to give his life. Who wore the tassels, fulfilling Malachi's prophecy that the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his zitzit. And it looks like little zitzit hanging down. They basically turned this chet, they enlarged it, and put uh, little tassels underneath it and a crown representing Messiah, the life. This is what is being hinted at in Judah's blessing that here his first coming, he's going to be humble. He's going to ride a donkey. But then it goes quickly to his second coming and his vestiture dipped in blood and his eyes like flaming fire, exactly what John saw in vision and his teeth whiter than milk. I think this is amazing that this is a prophecy so perfectly parallel in Revelation 19, hidden in Genesis 49. Yes, Stephen. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. That's where he gives his life. This, you know, what John saw in vision and what Jacob is prophesying in advance was actually explained by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 63. Isaiah says, who is that that comes from Edom? So Edom's descendants became Romans and Palestinians, both who are persecuting the Jews in the last days, right? So when Yeshua comes back arrayed in battle, he's coming back to put an end to the persecution of the Palestinians and the Romans that are taking Jerusalem for themselves instead of for God's people. So this is why he's signified as coming from uh, Edom with dyed garments from Basra. This, that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, he says, it is I. Wherefore art thou, why are you red in your apparel, the question is asked by the prophet Isaiah, and your garments, like him who treads the winepress, it gets all splattered up on you. Then the answer is given by Messiah, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood, their lifeblood, shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So we have three texts that are hinting at Messiah's age, or what we call the age of Mashiach, where he sets up his millennial kingdom, the very first thing that happens is he's taking Jerusalem back from those who are trampling it underfoot, and their life blood gets splattered upon him, and it's hinted at here in Yaakov's prophecy through Judah, and from John the Revelator, and through Isaiah the prophet, yes. Mm 
Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, the Yom Kippur service with the priest you know, doing the sacrificial beginning. Yeah. The blood stained garments and having to change his, his clothes like five times. That's right. The blood that you know, so All of this is symbolizing the king who will be also high priest. That day of atonement service also shows that other element of his um, office in the millennial kingdom king and high priest savior and um, he's saving us in more ways than one his first coming saves us from our sins his second coming is literally saving us from our enemies it says if time was not shortened no flesh would survive so he's a savior in every aspect of the word and an intercessor as high priest in the heavenly sphere over the last 2,000 years and interceding as our high priest and king um, when he sets up his kingdom so very powerful Verse 13 then goes on to Zebulon. Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Sidon. So whenever you see a ship, it's either referring to how the tribe got to that particular land, or that they intermarried with Zebulon, because the ship was, most likely they would use their brother's ships, to get to those lands. Zebulon was a sailor and always lived by the seashore. And sure enough, he did settle along the coast, even in the north and the west of the isles. Yissachar is a strong donkey lying down in the sheep sheds. On seeing how good is settled life and how pleasant the country, he will bend his back to the burden and submit to forced labor. So in the banners that we see Oftentimes, Issachar is depicted as a donkey with a burden that he's bearing. And this would describe the future of Issachar's tribes and how they would be farmers and how they would work with animals. And that continued on for thousands of years, even to our day. Wouldn't it be interesting if we found out that the major cattle ranchers and, and the sheep farmers in New Zealand's and, you know, they're scattered amongst all of the nations, and yet wherever they go, they are the, um, the men of husbandry, you know, with animals and the farmers. Dan, it says, will judge his people. Now, there's a very interesting prophecy here as well. He's not only, Dan means judge in Hebrew, and he's going to judge his other brothers. And maybe this is why he's not mentioned in the 144,000 account uh, in Revelation. He's the one tribe that's not mentioned there. But it prophesies that Dan will be like a viper on the road, a horn snake in the path. So it gives two different depictions of two different kinds of snakes. A viper in, in the path. So it's telling you the way Dan would go is going to be like a snake. It's going to be serpentine which is just like a river. And the river he followed to the north and to the west was the Danube, and he named it after himself, all the way up to Denmark, before he let, then caught up with Judah in uh, Ireland. So he went up all the way to the north and then came back down, and there was little parts of his family that stayed in all along those rivers. But this horned snake in the path is interesting. I always wondered what this was. And this year I thought I would give you a map and show you. He has two symbols because the adder bites the heel of the, the horse and causes it to go backward. And I looked up this word in the Hebrew. In the Strong's Concordance, you can find it as uh, H268. It's actually a whore. And this rider falling off backward, a whore, has more of a connotation in the Hebrew as facing the north and westward. It's telling you literally, here we read it in the English as the horse is falling off backwards. But what it's saying is he's moving northward and westward, causing the other people that reside in those lands to be displaced. That's why they're falling off their horse. But this word ahor has a double meaning. It's not only backward, but it means he's going to the north and to the west. Well, what river goes to the north and to the west? And when you look at it from an aerial view, looks like a horned snake. Because the delta, where the Danube comes out and where it begins, has the little horned, just like a horned um, asp. So you have the horned head here, and then it goes to the north and to the west, and here's another little horned here. So here God's looking from an aerial view, and he sees Dan's migration route is like a horned snake in the path, and he's dispelling everyone else along the way to the north and to the west. 
And of course, ach is the Hebrew word for brother, and he's to judge his brother. So that's even hinted at that, that as he goes along with the other ten tribes of the lost house of Israel, whoever does wrong, he's going to judge them. And this is hinted at all in this one word, achor. And then he says, I wait for your deliverance, Adonai, which means that he's going to recognize Yeshua. He's going to be part of the assembly of Messianic believers. And Dan is uh, waiting for the deliverance of Yeshua or Hashem. Verse 19 goes into Gad. Gad was prophesied to be a troop. He says a troop will troop on him. So he's going to be a troop, but there'll be another troop that ends up trooping on him. And this happened in history. But he will troop on their heels. So he gets taken out for a time, but then he comes back. And you can see him signified as... Uh, tents. So a tent was usually like an army battalion. They would amass themselves um, in encampments. And his tents were known as almost like teepee tents. And many suspect that it's very possible that the Native American tribes came from the tribe of Gad. They continued to keep that teepee dwelling encampment style of life. And we know that the Native Americans got trooped on, didn't they? <laughs> and yet they will come back. And so it's very possible that this is a little hint at Native Americans. Verse 20 says, Asher's food is rich. He will provide food fit for a king. So here's a royal chalice, and we see this used in different heraldry uh, as a symbol of Asher, because wherever he would go, he was known for his sweets, for his rich food, food fit for a king. Naphtali was known to be one of the fastest of all the brothers. So he was like a doe set free. And, you know, whenever someone is really healthy, let's say whether you're running or working out, you're in sports or Olympics, and they have children, it seems like their children are extra strong and fit. How that DNA, even by somebody keeping themselves fit, affects the next generation. So Naphtali is not only known as a doe, which is fast, but a doe is beautiful. And he was prophesied to have beautiful, healthy children. And we see the stag, uh, the doe, sometimes where you'll see a rampant golden lion on one side of a crest, you will see a doe on the other, which means that that particular family was part Judah and part Naphtali. Then in verse 22, it goes to Yosef. Yosef is a fruitful plant, a fruitful plant by a spring with branches climbing over the wall. The archers attacked him fiercely, shooting at him. So whenever Joseph's sons migrate, you're going to see arrows like we see in our own crest in America. Remember, the arrows are always going to be shooting at uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, at Joseph. They will attack him fiercely, shooting at him and pressing him hard, but his bow remained taut, and his arms were made nimble by the hand of the mighty one of Yaakov. From there, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, now it refers to the good shepherd as that stone that we know is the cornerstone. So Yosef's son, Ephraim and Manasseh, they're going to recognize and embrace uh, Yeshua, both in his first coming and his second coming. This has today become largely the Christian world of Great Britain and America. And look at how even our seal in America, I will show you, uh, has these arrows, which represent, and there's always 13 arrows, because they were leading the tr other tribes of Israel. By, to Manasseh in America. Now, it hasn't mentioned Manasseh yet, but it's just speaking of both of them in, through Joseph. Uh, That's why we can see it all through this. Yes, and he was actually the last, the 13th one, and that's why 13 is so significant for Manasseh. Absolutely. It says that from there the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you, by El Shaddai who will bless you with blessings from heaven above. And we know that all the tribes have been blessed by the blessings of America for the last 250 years. It's actually been a safe haven while they've been persecuted in all the other areas of their dispersion. He goes on, blessings from the deep lying below, blessings from the breast and the womb. The blessing of your father are more powerful than the blessings of my parents. So he's basically saying, this blessing I'm going to give you guys, it's more powerful than even the blessing Abraham and Isaac gave me. 
extending to the farthest of the everlasting hills. This is a prophecy of Ephraim in America here, exceeding all the way to those everlasting hills, you know, the ones beyond the great waters. So it's uh, a little hint at America there. They will be on the head of Yosef, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. So we see, through Joseph, Ephraim would be known as the bull who would push northward and westward, the other tribes, all the way to America, the arrows here. Um, even a unicorn is symbolized a lot of times as, um, because it talks about the horn pushing northward and westward in the prophecy. And then he finishes the blessing with Benjamin, his youngest. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, devouring the prey. In the evening, still dividing the spoil. So, we see this wolf on many crests in Europe. Here is the herald's emblem of Benjamin. And here are certain towns. Um, this is uh, in Germany. You can see the wolf. Benjamin resided in Germany. Uh, here's another place. Um, it's hard to see with the blurry names under there which towns it is, but Unter Grusbach, Germany. Here he's got the red. It's interesting that here they're making him red, which makes you wonder, was there any intermarriage with Zara's people? Here he's black, which is just Benjamin, and this is most usual. Here you've got the castle of Issachar, or no, uh, Simeon, the castle of Simeon, with the wolf of Benjamin. So this area had these two tribes marrying. Yes? It's interesting that besides the black and the white, most of the colors that are used here are red and yellow. Red, white, and black uh, in Germany. Yeah. Here's England. England has uh, a wolf in it. Um, this was one little borough of England, not the predominantly. But um, here is the clan house of Ireland. Uh, here is Cochrane and uh, Robertson. And so you can see even Benjamin was able to go to these other areas where Judah was at and intermarry as well. I'm going to give you some examples of the intermixture of all these symbols that Joseph just gave his sons. Notice how the ensigns or banners of the various tribes are incorporated into them and look for the shields and symbols at least 150 years old. The more modern ones, they're not as accurate because people don't know the art of ancient heraldry. But So if you go past 150 years ago, it's very accurate as to which tribes were in certain areas and intermarrying. So here is the symbol of Great Britain. And you see the golden lion of Judah. And you see the white unicorn of Ephraim. And then down here in the crest, you see a red line of Zara and the harp. See the harp of David, which is even more specific as to it's gold, which tells you it's Perez, right? And David came from Perez's line uh, of Judah. And that's why anything Perez is going to be golden. So here's proof of Great Britain having Ephraim, Judah, and uh, mixed together. Here's the seal of the United States. 13 stars representing the 13 tribes, all here. Uh, I believe in Revelation, when it says that the woman, which is the descendants of Israel, would be hidden uh, in the wilderness, I believe this is speaking of America, which was the only unpopulated area in its infancy. All the other world powers arose out of the waters, uh, which represent multiple nations, peoples, tongues, the, the populated area of the Middle East, basically. America would be the only place that would look like a wilderness to John in vision. And so here we have all 13 tribes being hidden in America. Um, during these last 250 years leading up to the time of trouble. The star matrix is the Star of David. Notice the shape that the 13 stars are in. The eagle is from the tribe of Dan, and the eagle is also a brigade banner. The bows and the arrows in his feet represent Manasseh, and the cloud reflects the pillar of cloud that Hashem used to cloak himself in in the wilderness over the tabernacle. So many people don't realize the biblical origins of even our symbol and the people who founded our country. 
Here is a flag from Ireland. It's called the beautiful Ulster flag. And in the middle is the red hand of Zara, the one who had the scarlet thread on him. He first settled Ireland. But there's the golden crown because Perez came later. And it's in the shape of a Star of David. So there's no doubt that Ireland is full of Judah. These are the real Jews. <laughs> Do you know the Jews that came back and have settled uh, Israel since 1948 have come from Eastern Europe, right? Uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardic Jews from Spain, um, Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Russia. Um, they were all of the different tribes of Israel. They're not just Judah. They were preserving Torah in the little kibbutzes and, and pogroms and places where they were living, but it doesn't mean that they're only from Judah, even though they call themselves Jews. So the Jews of Israel today are really a beginning of the second exodus. They're total mixed tribes, but they don't even know which tribe they're from, unless they've carried on their last name, like you'll hear somebody's last name being Reuben or Levi or Cohen. What's that? Cohen, Cohen yeah, the priestly line. And uh, why would symbols of Israel's royalty be on the flag of a people who have been taught that they are Gentiles? Do you know when Paul, the lost book of Acts, chapter 29, it says that one of the last places he went to was the Isles of Ireland. And he met with even the Druids. And it says by their rites and ceremonies, he recognized them to be one of the lost houses of Israel. And it doesn't tell which one he determined that they were. But basically, the Celts and the Druids were residing in Ireland. And he recognized that they were a part of the ancient house of Israel. And we know that to be Dan and uh, Judah that resided there. Um, it is because they are not Gentiles but Israelites who have lost the knowledge of their true identity and the proof is in their flags to this day. Here's another example. This is in East Staffordshire, England. Okay, You have the rampant stag. Remember Nephtali? Beautiful and fast. You have the golden lion from Judah. And the wavy blue lions down here are Reuben, the chaotic waters. And the castle gate from Simeon down here at the bottom. So here in Staffordshire, England, which is, I would say, southeast of London, uh, you can see remnants of these four tribes even there. What symbol is this? Yeah, it would be Judah, the lion, the rampant lion. And what is it, a symbol? What flag is this the flag of? This is the city flag of Jerusalem. Yeah, which is primarily Judah, but you have the two trees, the two olive trees, which God says to the prophet Ezekiel, take two trees, two sticks, if you will. Call one Judah for him and his companion, and call the other one Joseph for Ephraim and his companions. Basically, it represents the whole house of Israel being there in Jerusalem, which they are. There's people from every tribe there in Jerusalem. But predominantly, the inheritance, the land, is Judah's. And Messiah will sort out who gets what inheritance in the land. Those of you that were in Jerusalem with me that met the mayor, remember we got the little pins with this symbol on it, the rampant lion, the eternal capital. So, did you know it is prophesied in the last days that God will set up his own banner for Mashiach? I thought it would be fun to incorporate some of the prophecies that talk about, we've talked about the tribes and how everything Jacob said ended up reflecting the 13 tribes, uh, including Ephraim and Manasseh, and the, the path of their dispersion. But there's a prophecy in Isaiah 11, verse 12 and 13, that says, He shall set up a flag banner. And this word in the Hebrew has a connotation of a beacon or a standard bearer, actually somebody who holds the flag. So he's got a symbol, and he is the beacon or the standard bearer uh, for God. It says, For the nations... And he shall assemble the outcast of Israel. Well, who's the only one who's going to return the exiles of Israel who's scattered amongst all the nations? Mashiach. This is why the Jews of Israel today don't recognize Yeshua as a Messiah, because the Messiah is prophesied to do three things. He's to return the exiles to Jerusalem or to Israel, and he's to rebuild the temple. 
and reign, set up his kingdom as high priest and king. So this is a hidden prophecy of Messiah, and it says that he will gather all of these dispersed of Israel and of the house of Judah, those two sticks, from the four corners of the earth. So where does this tell you that they're dispersed? Everywhere, from the four corners of the earth. Now remember... When Yeshua comes, Paul describes it like this. He says, The Lord shall descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. That's on the day of trumpeting. And it says, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. And then, there's another passage that says, The angels shall gather his elect from where? From the four corners of the earth. So the dead that are rising, that have belief in Yeshua, that have died if their belief in Yeshua, all around the earth, in the lands of their dispersion, will be resurrected. And if you take the earth as a ball, people are being resurrected on all different sides. They're rising up from the earth, right? And we who are alive and remain, the translation group, the last little remnant, are being caught up with them. But where is Yeshua? He's hovering over the Mount of Olives the same place he ascended from. So this is why the angels have to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. He's basically gathering them all to where he's at. And then he can take them to the marriage supper of the Lamb before he brings them back and gives them their inheritance uh, in, the, uh, in the land of Israel. Every tribe... God knows what tribe, as we've seen, most areas, even Ireland, has many different tribes within a certain area. What has the majority in you? Which tribe are you the majority of, right? We don't know. That's been lost throughout history, but God knows. And he prophesies through Ezekiel that he will give you your share with your brothers from the tribe that you're the majority of. That's exciting to think about. You have your own inheritance in the land. He says, The envy also in that day of Ephraim shall depart. Well, who's Ephraim, did we discover? The British Empire and those that, from the British Empire that have settled in America, right? So they've been envied. The world has envied them. They've become the, the last two world powers, Britain and America. They're the envy of the world. That's going to depart because the greatest kingdom is going to be led by Mashiach in Jerusalem and Israel. And the adversaries of Judah, all those that decided to persecute the Jews throughout the known world, that's going to end. That will be cut off. Then it goes from that focus to Ephraim shall not envy Judah. Ephraim in America and in Britain has really envied the Jews being able to return to the land early and keeping Torah and living out Torah in the land. The people here are envious of our Jewish brother, our elder brother Judah. But Judah has kind of held them at bay, right? Don't come in so fast. We don't really trust your intentions. They're vexing Ephraim. That's going to end when Mashiach makes the two sticks one in his hand. So beautiful prophecies uh, hidden in Isaiah 11. Let's go on to verse 33. It says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is how their father spoke to them and blessed them, giving each his own individual blessing. Then he charged them as follows, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my ancestors in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah by Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought together with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a burial place belonging to him. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Yitzhak and his wife Rivka. There I buried Leah, the field and the cave in it, which was purchased from the sons of Het. He's telling them exactly, I want you to not leave me or bury me here in Egypt. Take me to that place that's waiting for me in the land. There was an old concept that if you weren't in the land of Israel at the time of the resurrection, you might not make it, or you might not be resurrected. So it's very important to be, you ever, when I showed you the Mount of Olives, you see those white tombstones. I mean, they want to be right there at the source of where Mashiach will be, resurrecting the dead. So Yaakov is expressing how important it is for him to be taken back to the land and not left in Egypt. When Yaakov had finished charging his sons, it's interesting, the whole passage 
Vayache is all about him living until he finished blessing his sons first, right? He's blessing his son's future. So when he had finished with the greatest purpose of his life, which is to prophetically speak into their future descendants' lives, then he's like, my work is done. That's what it means by he is finished, charging his sons. He drew up his legs into the bed and <sighs> breathed his last. It doesn't say he died. And he was gathered to his people. This is very similar to our Torah portion in 1 Kings, where it's speaking of David's last words. And David did not die, but it contrasts David with Joab, who, it says, Joab died, David slept with his fathers. The same way here, it's purposely leaving out that word moat. Yaakov didn't die. The early rabbis and sages recognized that Yaakov lives on through his descendants and through the blessing that he blessed his descendants with. David slept with his fathers, and the righteous do not die, but they only sleep. We know this because of Yeshua's words. So I thought we would take, in between 49 and this last chapter of 50, look at some of the symbolism of the first and second death hinted at by not only Yaakov not being said in the Hebrew that he dies, but even in our Hof Torah, where David is not said that he died. It says, when Yaakov made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet to the bed and he breathed out and he was gathered to his people. This is the way it describes him expiring. And this word here is... Gavar, ga gava. It is literally to breathe out, to expire. Not die, which is mot in the Hebrew, but gava. In Tanis 5b, it says, Our father Jacob did not die. Rabbi Yochanan maintains that Jacob did not die, even though the Torah relates below that he was mourned, embalmed, and buried. He cites the verse. This is interesting. This is a 2,000 year, you know, 2,000 years ago uh, rabbi who quotes Jeremiah 30 in understanding that Yaakov can live on. And he says, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, said Hashem, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for I will save you from afar. He's basically referencing a messianic text for the reason why Jacob can live on and why the resurrection can happen. I'm going to save you from afar and your descendants from captivity. So Messiah will come and the first one and save us from his sins and save us from the whole captivity of death. And in his second coming, save us from our exile and bring us back to the land. Two different types of saving. Thus the prophet equates Jacob with his descendants. This implies just as his descendants live on, so does he through them. Israel lives on spiritually because his offspring maintain his heritage to Torah. And it's through his descendants that Yeshua came to save us by conquering death so that although we might sleep, we will not truly die the second death experience which he took upon himself, which is the death that eternally separates you from God. So it reminded me of the Brit Hadashah, a couple of references to where Yeshua said a certain person is not dead, they're only sleeping. Remember the girl in Luke 8? Verse 52, it says, All were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she's not dead, but sleeping. We have this hope of the resurrection, and that even though we might breathe out our last, it is not truly death that separates us from God. It's only a temporary sleep until the resurrection. John 11, 11 through 13 says, These things he said, now this is speaking of Lazarus' account. After that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might awake him out of sleep. And when he comes, that's what he's going to be doing, is awaking the saints out of their slumber. All the saints that have slept from the time of Adam through the last 6,000 years in him. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall not... If he sleep, he does well. However, Yeshua spake of his death. But they thought he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Remember Daniel? Daniel speaks of the resurrection. And he says there will be two different resurrections. One is for everlasting life. The other one is to eternal condemnation. This is in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. 
He says, when that time comes, speaking of the last days, Mikael, the great prince who protects your people, will stand up. And there will be a time of trouble, unparalleled, between the time that they became a nation to that moment. Worse than ever before. At that time, your people will be delivered. So when Mashiach comes back, everyone's going to be delivered. Whose name is found written in the book? Many of those sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken. So the first resurrection is for everlasting life. Then he speaks of the other group, some to everlasting shame and abhorrence. That's speaking of after the thousand years. Yeshua died for everyone. And what's amazing is even if you don't accept it, the proof is going to be in that even they will be resurrected. But they will be resurrected with the same mindset that they went into the grave with, which is to take the city of Jerusalem by force. That's why they're referred to as Gog and Magog in Revelation. And Satan easily musters them because they have that same carnal, rebellious spirit against God and his people and his land and his city, his holy city and his temple. And they try to take the city by force. So you see these two different aspects of the resurrection but the fact of the matter is Yeshua died for all of us God was reconciling the whole world to himself through Yeshua HaMashiach in our Hof Torah it relates to David's end of days and a righteous man doesn't really die does he because of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world we only sleep and even in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, it is revealing this through Yaakov not saying that he died, and through David not saying that he died, while it's telling others uh, that they died. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go in the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord. He's giving, just like Jacob, the last message to his son is a message of follow the Lord, keep Torah, be blessed. So he's telling Solomon, keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn yourself that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee a man to sit upon the throne of Israel. So basically he understands that Mashiach is going to come through him, but it's a big responsibility for your descendants to keep hold of Torah. Otherwise, imagine if Joseph and Mary had no knowledge of Torah. They're totally godless, idolatrous, like Dan in the north of Israel, right? Who's going to raise this son of God to be a deliverer, to be a savior, to be an overcomer? He, the grave, he would have never been able to be resurrected from the grave if he had sinned in one point. So it's so instrumental that the tribe of Judah would maintain the Torah so that whoever his parents would be, they would be able to exemplify it and teach it to him properly so that he wouldn't have to go through the school of hard knocks and be a failed messiah as so many were so david is admonishing solomon and his descendants to not fail thee and if you don't fail we won't fail to have a man on the throne of israel so verse 10 says david slept with his fathers and he was buried in the city of david now, when you jump ahead from our Hof Torah to 1 Kings chapter 11, look at how it contrasts David's sleeping, going to sleep in the Lord, with Joab, the commander of his army. Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers. So it reiterates this. It doesn't use the word moat, death. And that Joab, the commander of the army, had died. But it uses it for jo Joab. Isn't that an interesting correlation? These little anomalies in Torah. Otherwise, why wouldn't it just say that Hadad heard that David and Joab both died? No, it's saying David slept, Joab died. And Hadad said to Pharaoh, Give me leave, and I shall go to my country. So Rashi comments on uh, 1 Kings 11, verse 21, and he says that David slept with his fathers concerning David who died a natural death, an expression of sleeping is mentioned, whereas concerning Joab who was killed, an expression of dying is mentioned. Another explanation, he's trying to figure it out because Rashi doesn't understand this aspect of when you die as a righteous man, 
you have the hope of the resurrection and it's only a temporary sleep, right? So Rashi's trying to figure out why does it use a different word for David than it uses for Joab without the knowledge of Mashiach, which is really what um, gives us deeper insight and deeper understanding. He uh, goes on to say, another expression is that concerning David, who was survived by a meritorious son who took his place, that means somebody who was good, that kept Torah or taught Torah, kept Israel unified uh, during his reign, an expression of sleeping is mentioned. Whereas concerning Joab, now remember, Yeshua came through this, this lineage. Whereas concerning Joab, who was not survived by a meritorious, uh, meritorious son who took his place, no expression of sleeping is mentioned. So he's recognizing Joab, who's not righteous, his sons weren't righteous either. David, who is righteous, has a righteous son. Hmm, there's some correlation here. One only slept, one died. He's trying to put it together, but he's missing the missing piece of the puzzle, which is Yeshua, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, in whom we have the hope of the resurrection, and why we don't have eternal death. Otherwise, the wages of sin is what? Death. That's eternal separation from God. The, sin who, the soul who sins shall die. And we know that Isaiah says, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, our Messiah. So it's contrasting, Romans 6.23 there, those who don't have Messiah Yeshua as their Savior, their death is going to be a perpetual separation from the Father. In Hebrews, Paul, in Rome, uh, Hebrews eleven twenty one, says, By faith, Jacob, when dying, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Here's that mention of that sapphire staff that uh, was passed down from Adam. It was well known, very special. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. In 1 Peter 1 through 3, we see a mention of the blessing of being in Messiah Yeshua. He says, Blessed be the Elohim and the Abba, the Father of our Mashiach Yeshua. According to his great mercy, still speaking of God the Father, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yehoshua HaMashiach from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed when? In the last days. This is when it will be revealed, at the resurrection. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yehoshua HaMashiach. Though you have not seen him, you by faith love him. Though you do not now see him, because he's in the heavenly sphere holding on to this reward, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is salvation of your souls, eternal life. Hallelujah. Praise God. All hinted at in the Torah portion. Who would think that this would be in the blessing of Yaakov? So now... In closing, we're going to look at this chapter 50. Yo Joseph is 57 years old at this point. Okay, remember, how old was Jacob when he died? 147. How old was he? That's right. And how old was he when he uh, had Joseph? 90 years old. So you subtract 90 from 147. Joseph's 57 years old. And he falls on his father's face as he breathes out his last. And he weeps over him and he kisses him. Then Yosef ordered the physicians in his service to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were spent at this, the normal amount of time for embalming. Then the Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. 
When the period of mourning was over, Yosef addressed the household of Pharaoh. I would like to ask a favor. Tell Pharaoh, my father had me swear an oath. He said, I'm going to die, and you're to bury me in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. So the cave of Machpelah was known as the du double cave. So when Abraham bought it, there was only one couple in that cave, in one of the compartments. That was Adam and Hava, or Eve. Abraham and Sarah used the other compartment. So Isaac must have had to hew now a section uh, for himself and for Rivka. And Jacob hewed out for Leah and buried her first and then hewed out a place for himself to be later buried. And this is what he's referring to. Therefore, I beg you, let me go up and bury my father. I will return. Pharaoh responded, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Yosef went up to bury his father. With him went all Pharaoh's servants, the leaders of his household, and the leaders of the land of Egypt, all the dignitaries, along with the entire household of Yosef, his brothers and his father's household. Remember, his brothers and father have been living there in Egypt and multiplying for the last 17 years. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their cattle did they leave back in the land of Goshen. So all the heads went. Moreover, there went up with them both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very large caravan. When they arrived at the threshing floor in Atad, beyond the Jar Jordan, they raised a loud and bitter lamentation, mourning for his father for seven days. So they cross the Jordan, and they start just wailing. And this is done to this day. It's called sitting Shiva. You mourn for seven days um, after the death of a loved one. And imagine the Canaanites hearing this wailing, because Israel could wail. I mean, when Judah cried out uh, in Egypt, all of the Egyptians heard it. When Joseph wept over his, seeing his brothers, all of the Egyptians heard it. So this is the largest funeral procession in history with a big caravan coming across the Jordan. And then all these men start wailing. And they're, they're in the royal chariots and the royal dignitaries of Egypt and, and of the Israelites. So the Canaanites really took notice. When the local inhabitants, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the floor of Atad, they said, How bitterly the Egyptians are mourning! This is why, to this day, the place was given the name Avel Mitzrayim, which means the mourning of Egypt, there beyond the river Jordan. His sons did to him as he had ordered them to do. They carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Avraham had bought along with the field as a burial place belonging to him from Ephron the Hittite by Mamre. Then, after burying his father, Yosef returned to Egypt, he, his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Realizing that their father was dead, Yosef's brothers said, Yosef may hate us now and pay us back in full for all the suffering we have caused him. So they sent a message to Yosef, a little white lie. And just in case, the only reason he was kind to them was to honor his father. They said, your father gave this order before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you now, please forgive your brother's crimes and wickedness in doing you harm. <laughs> So now we beg of you, for father's sake, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they said this to him. And his brothers came and they prostrated themselves again before him. Remember two other times they had prostrated themselves before him. Reminding him of the dream of the sheaves bowing down. And they said, here we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God to judge you? You meant to do me harm, but God used it for good. And that's the beautiful lesson that we constantly see throughout the Torah. If we will allow him, God will reverse the curse and he will turn it back into blessings. Just like the fast that we observed this, this week, the 10th of Tevet, in the kingdom, all the fast, the fast of the fourth month and the fifth month and the fast of the seventh month and the tenth month will be turned to feasting and joy as times, looking at how God has overcome through Messiah Yeshua for Israel. So he says, God did it, meant it for good so that it would come about as it is to this day with so many people's lives being saved. And this is the way we should look, you know, not only with our tongue only being used as a blessing, but wherever we are sent, 
through the lands of the nations and throughout our dispersion, we have to think, how does God intend to use me here to be a blessing to the nations, to save people's lives? And for those of us that are believers in Yeshua, that incorporates sharing with them the good news. And this is what began to go out 2,000 years ago to the lost house of Israel, the good news of people's lives being saved through the suffering servant and the prophet like unto Moshe, who will one day return and be king and high priest of Israel. So, Joseph comforted them, and he said, Don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. I'm going to be a blessing for you. In this way, he comforted them, speaking kindly to them. A good lesson for us. Joseph continued living in Egypt. Another 53 years he lived, because he died at 110. So now, between verse 21 and the mourning for the father at age 57, verse 22 jumps 53 years into the future. Yosef lived 110 years, and he lived to see Ephraim's third generation. Now, your Bibles might have it translated as his great-grandchildren, right? But in the Hebrew, it actually is the third generation. And in this word, it's shaloshim, there is an enlarged memsofit. Here it is, taken picture from one of the Torah scrolls, referring to the third generation of Joseph through the line of Ephraim. He lived long enough to be able to see that third generation. Remember the blessing that was put upon Ephraim? That he would become a multitude of nations, a melogoyim. And in prophecy, how are people's nations and tongues symbolized in Revelation? How? What's the symbol? All of the beasts came up out of the populated areas of the world, and the beast arose out of the waters, it says, right? The waters are people, nations, and tongues. Revelation, being its own interpreter, tells us. What's amazing is the mam is the one letter that is a symbol of water. Yeah. So, and the, and the mem is enlarged, the mem sophie, showing that Ephraim, to the third generation, Joseph is confirmed that he's multiplying very quickly and that he will be a melogoyim. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, he's remembering back that blessing. It displeased him, and he held his father's hand back to remove it from Ephraim's head. And he said to his father, Don't do this, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand upon his head. But Yaakov refused and said, I know, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother Ephraim... He will be greater than he, and his seed will become a multitude of nations. And so we have another hidden anomaly in the Torah scroll with this enlarged mem re representing all of the multitude of people that would come from the multitude of nations, the Melogoyim from Ephraim's line. Yosef said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely remember you and bring you up out of the land this land of Egypt, to the land that he swore to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then Yosef took an oath from the sons of Israel. God will surely remember you. So he's dying before his brothers. And you are to carry my bones up from here, just like you did our fathers, he's reminding them. So Yosef died at the age of 110, and they embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt until after the Exodus, in which when they left with Moses, they carried that coffin of Yosef, and they carried it up to Shechem, and that's where it's been buried to this very day. So, we have completed the book of Bereshit. So stand up and congratulate one another with the greeting, Hazak, Hazat, Venit, Hazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. This is something we say after each of the completions of the Torah books, and we'll close in prayer. Abba, Father, we thank you for strengthening us and encouraging us, Father, to be patient and to persi persist and to persevere, even as John saw in vision the saints who would have both the commandments of God and the testimony of Yeshua. Father, here is the patience of the saints. We desire to persevere through the coming time of trouble. We desire to be a blessing, not only in this land, but to those in Israel. And we desire to follow 
Messiah, Yeshua's example that was symbolized by Yosef in Messiah bin Yosef in being a blessing to his brothers, the whole house of Israel, and helping reunify them together as one. You have prophesied that the Son of Man should bring them near to one another, and you would make them one in his hand. And so, Father, we ask for the means to do this. Empower us and provide the blessings that we can. Send this message forth and call forth all the house of Israel from amongst the nations in anticipation of Mashiach's soon coming. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for revealing such beautiful symbols and types and even our own identity in this, Father, who we are today, the lost house of Israel that you are restoring for your glory and for your purpose. We praise you and we thank you. And we ask your blessing upon the whole house of Israel and all the lands of their dispersion, and especially upon Jerusalem, Shalu Shalom, Yerushalayim. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem as we know the things that must come to pass in these last days. So we thank you, Father, and we ask for your hand and covering to be upon all of your children, all of us, the children of Yaakov and of Yitzhak and of Abraham. This is our prayer. In your holy name we pray. Amen.